If you want college football in September, this was a great week for you. And it's amazing because it's amazing to me how quickly things can change in the narrative that is sports in kind of the COVID-19 era. Just last week, I was telling you guys, be patient. It's going to be okay. I know you're hearing all sorts of crazy things out of California, but I promise you, things will calm down. They have calmed down in some states. As I said a minute ago, they've calmed down in Georgia. They've calmed down in Tennessee. They've calmed down in Texas. Things are getting back to normal in a lot of places. And I told you, California will get there. California was the fly in the ointment of college football. It seemed like our governor and our mayors were were adamant that they were going to keep this city locked down and this state locked down for months into the future. Yet here we are on Monday, the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, said that pro sports can return to the state of California. Great first step for eventually the college football season returning to the state of California. But then... The big news of the week came Wednesday when the NCAA said that, as I said off the top, major sports athletes, so football, men's basketball, women's basketball, can return to campus for voluntary workouts starting on June 1st, which is, of course, a little over to a little under two weeks away from what I'm recording now. And so before we get into it, what I would very simply say is let me, let me kind of lay out some stuff because you see that big, bold headline, and this still is just one step in ultimately getting college athletics back on the field. First of all, this is not a mandate to open up campuses, right? So June 1st is the first time that players can go back to campus, live on campus. It, it, you know, and by the way, there, I think I've mentioned this on the show, but there have been some student athletes actually living on campus but, uh, you know, this is the first time, and, and when I say they've been living on campus, it's, it's student athletes that are from overseas that can't easily get home, that maybe don't have access to what they need academically at home. So there have been student athletes on campus, but this is the first blanket you're allowed to bring everybody back. And so all this means is very simply this, is one, the NCAA is basically saying, we're not going to restrict you. And so it doesn't mean that every school and every state is going to have student athletes back on campus June 1st. What it means is it is now up to the discretion of the school and the discretion of the conference to make decisions that they believe are best for them. So as an example, my buddy Matt Jones, Kentucky Sports Radio, I saw him tweet out that he believes that as early as uh, Friday, I believe is what he said, is that the SEC will vote on when they will allow their schools to come back to, to schools to allow their kids to come back to campus. The Pac-12, I believe, will have a vote later this week. Doesn't mean that in the SEC, all 14 schools will have everyone back on campus at the same time. Doesn't mean that in the Pac-12, all 12 schools will ha- will have kids back on campus. But there will be a set date, and the NCAA is no longer in the way. The NCAA is saying you guys do what you think is best for your individual university, your individual state. We are not going to stop that. To take it a step further, we are not going into full-scale practice, right? And so for people who don't know the academic calendar, as it pertains to basketball, coaches in a normal summer get eight individual workouts, basically two workouts a week for four straight weeks during the summer. That is not happening. That is, it's not uh, John Calipari or Coach K running formal practices. Obviously, in football, the practices don't really start until the end of July after media days. That is not where we're at right now. What it is is voluntary workouts, and I believe they will mostly be, you know, very heavily um, social distance and things like that. You know, Eric Musselman, the head coach at Arkansas, came on last week, and he talked a lot about this. He talked about the reality that student athletes may, you know, you may only have one or two kids in the gym at a time. You may only have one coach with one kid. You may not have more than one player on one specific basket as it pertains to basketball. In terms of the weight room, I've seen reports of no more than 10, 12, 15 guys in a massive weight room at once, six feet apart while they're working out, coaches wearing masks. So it it is not back to normal, but it is a step in the right direction. And for somebody like me who has been adamant from day one, I believed there was going to be football. I never wavered from that. This is the biggest step so far. Now, in terms of the why of this, I think there's two reasons why this is starting to happen now. One, 
states themselves are starting to loosen up. I actually think there's like three or four reasons. I'll just I'll just rattle them off. One, states are starting to loosen up restrictions themselves. And so I think what a Florida is doing, a Georgia is doing, a Tennessee is doing, is they're basically very simply saying this, or what the NCAA is doing on behalf of them, is that what the NCAA is basically doing is saying, look, if the governor of Georgia believes it's safe for people to get together, for people to congregate at restaurants, people to congregate at bars, people to congregate at the beach, although I don't even know if Georgia has any beaches, if they can go to gyms, then it doesn't really make sense for us to not allow our student athletes back on campus. It doesn't really make sense for us to allow them to come back to a safe environment, which I'm going to get into in a minute. And I think it kind of plays into the second part, which is really the first part, which is very simply this. The people that run these states have decided it's safe, and the people who run these schools have decided it's safe. Now, not every school is on the same page as everywhere else. But I give uh, credit to both the school presidents as well as the politicians that are not doing what all of us, including myself, including people that I love, are doing. They're not sitting around watching the news, freaking themselves out, going on Facebook, seeing what Aunt Mildred posted about this, that, or the other thing. They're taking actual data to inform decisions both for the state itself and, of course, for the university. And so I've been over this a million times. But I think we all know by now, the rates of infection, the death rates are mostly, go- I don't want to say, I, you know, I'm, to be clear, I'm not saying for every single state because every state is different. But for the most part, as the weather has warmed up, the rates are going down. Social distancing did work. Um, we're also finding out and we have continued to find out that again, while young people can be infected by this illness, many end up being asymptomatic. Remember, The Brooklyn Nets had four guys test positive for COVID-19 when they were tested right after the season. Only one of them even showed symptoms. Donovan Mitchell, who of course was, you know, kind of the the famous test case with Rudy Gobert, Donovan Mitchell showed no symptoms. And so I think schools are making educated guesses, or I take that back, I don't even want to say educated guesses. They are making educated decisions on what to do. I find it very interesting, by the way, that a lot of schools this week have actually decided Based on the data, again, we're only going based on what the experts are telling us and what the data is telling us. A lot of schools have actually decided to move up the academic calendar. This is a big topic of conversation. I think it'll be a bigger conversation as we get more towards basketball. But this week, we saw Notre Dame. We saw Syracuse. We saw the University of South Carolina announce that they're actually, they're going to bring kids back to campus, but they're going to start the academic calendar early and get kids off of campus by Thanksgiving. The thought process behind that is very simply that if a second wave does come when the weather cools down in the fall, late fall, early winter, we do want these kids off campus. And so what will instead happen is that there will be, rather than there being a fall break, there will be, the semester will start earlier, it will finish earlier, and there will be an extended winter break to hopefully avoid what could be that second peak in the, in the late fall, early winter, which is what a lot of people are fearing. So again, the state politicians are making decisions based on data, and so are the schools. I think finally, the third reason why this is happening is because I think that these administrators, and really as it pertains to college sports specifically, I think they're starting to realize that the safest place that these kids can actually be is on a college campus with their team. And I know to a lot of you, that probably sounds crazy. How can you say that 85 football players in a a closed, confined space is safer than being at home? Well, that's not what I'm saying. First of all, we will never at any point do I believe in the very near future on any campus have 85 kids in the room at once, have in basketball 15 kids working out at once. As I said, this is not come back and have full-scale practices. This is come back voluntary workouts, social distancing, masks, all that stuff. And so why now? Why as it pertains to being safe? As I said, I do believe this is where college kids are the safest. And if you don't believe me, let me just kind of explain why. I think the bottom line is, and this comes from, by the way, I've been talking to coaches about this since March when this thing first happened. But The bottom line is, is that there are times where a kid can go home to his house with his parents where he's from and be safe. 
have a place to work out if he needs to, get good meals, get good health care if he needs to. Maybe his parents are a doctor, his parents are a lawyer, they have the best access to doctors. There are plenty of athletes across the country that have that. There are quite a few more, though, who probably don't, and I don't know what the percentage is. But what I can tell you is that in talking to coaches all over the country since this thing started, there are just a lot of kids that come from really unfortunate circumstances. I mean, even from strictly the academic side, I've heard coaches talk about, you know, my kid comes from a, a family where they have six, seven people living in a one-bedroom apartment. How is he supposed to do online coursework when he can't even find five space to have a little five feet of space to have a little privacy? Some play, I've, I've heard coaches say like they have kids that literally don't have the internet at their house. So just from, from an academic standpoint, it, it, it isn't ideal. But then you think about it from a health standpoint. Five, six, seven people in a one-bedroom apartment is probably not the best way to protect people in the middle of a pandemic. I would add, there are also circumstances to the opposite effect. Talk to coaches, especially in football, especially in the South. There are very rural parts of this country as well that many of these athletes come from. Many of them are hours from the closest hospital, maybe a half an hour from a, even a pediatrician or somebody that can take care of them if they show symptoms. And so why is it safest to have them back on campus? Well, it's very simply this, is that it is safest to have them back on campus because of the fact that when they are on campus, they can be monitored daily, temperature checks daily. I don't know that schools will go as far as to test them daily, but I think at the big schools at Alabama, at Clemson, at Ohio State, the money is there. It's possible. They will work out rather than going to the high school and hoping that nobody's in the gym at the same time. They can work out in a safe, clean, sterile environment. They have access to great doctors. One thing that I harp on all the time on this show, the medical support that these athletes get is second to none. Some of the best doctors in the world work on these campuses where, God forbid, something happens, the kids can be taken care of. They get their meals taken care of, which ultimately doesn't really matter, but anything you can do to keep your immune system up, even better. Certainly better than what some of these kids are eating at home. No disrespect. This isn't a socioeconomical thing. It's a fact. And so I think these schools have realized that it is actually best to have these kids on campus. Now, again, there are still a lot of steps to be made to actually get games on Saturdays. But as I've said all along, as I said last week, we still have, relatively speaking, plenty of time, especially if most of these kids do get back to campus sometime early to middle of June. We still got two and a half months after the middle of June before these games actually kick off. Three and a half months from now until the games actually kick off. So again, I've said from the beginning, I believe games will be played, but this was the greatest step in the right direction for that to happen. All right, now I want to talk about the other thing as it pertains to this, and that is kind of the new conversation that has popped up in college athletics, okay? And so what do I mean by that? What I mean is I try to keep you guys abreast of everything that's going on in college sports as it pertains to to everything, really. And, and obviously, look, there are times where I'm breaking down games during football season or basketball season. Times I'm breaking down recruiting. Times I'm breaking down transfers. Times I'm breaking down reclassifications. But right now, kind of the context of college sports is everything, every narrative starts around this coronavirus. And so what I will tell you is, even though I never personally believed that games were at jeopardy, two, three, four weeks ago, that was the conversation. <laughs> is there a possibility we don't play games this fall? Well, I think we've moved past that. I think most agree. I don't know that you would get 100% unanimity. Unanimity? Is that the right word? I think it's the right word. I don't know that you'll ever get 100% unanimity that we are 100% getting games in the fall. I do think we will, though. But I think the bigger question that is now the conversation within college athletics, what will the game day experience look like? And what I mean by that is this. Will there be no fans in the stands? Will there be fans required to wear masks? Or realistically, which is now the conversation, are we going to do fans in the stands, but potentially at less than 100% capacity? And what I mean by that is very simply this. Do we figure out a way to social distance in the context 
of a college football Saturday. So does that mean that you know even at an Alabama, a person that normally has 10 season tickets can only have five? Does it mean that you have a, a, a package where season ticket holders only get access to four home games instead of seven? Some get access to three, that you don't sell single game tickets. These are the conversations that are being had because while I will say that for the hundredth time, I've been confident that there will be college football. I have never once said, and I still don't know what the college game experience will look like. I do not know. I cannot say with certainty, nor can anyone, if there will be fans in the stands. I can't say whether it will be at 50% capacity, 25% capacity. I saw Ohio State's athletic director, Gene Smith, today said, they're already putting together plans to figure out, you know, can we do 20,000? Can we do 25,000? Which for the horseshoe would be 25% capacity. And so I don't know that this is the sexiest topic to talk about on a podcast like this, but I do think it is the next step, the next evolution with the college football experience. Like I said, I think most of us agree we're probably going to get games in September. Whatever I said, three and a half full months away till the start of the season, you think about how far this conversation has come really just in the last couple weeks, let alone the last couple months, and where it will be a couple months from now. But now the bigger question becomes, how do you keep everybody happy? And I think that is, if you're a college football fan, if you're a season ticket holder, if you normally attend games, that is the topic that is going to be pressing going forward. And I'll tell you this. You know, I said, uh, you know, in a minute, I'm going to talk about the DeAndre Williams deal at Kentucky and Memphis and Arkansas and Baylor. I'm going to say I don't envy college basketball coaches, no matter how much they're paid. I don't envy college administrators either. Because like I just said, there is a very realistic proposition in the not too distant future that Alabama's AD or their ticket director or their assistant ticket director is going to have to call somebody that's had 10 season tickets in their family for decades and tell them, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Smith, I'm sorry, we can only give you five this year. Or Mr. Mr. Smith, Mrs. Smith, we can give you the 10, but you can only come to every other game. We can only give you four games out of seven as opposed to the full seven because we have to accommodate other season ticket holders who aren't going to be able to get into the same games you are. And so I do think over the next couple weeks, it is very realistic that there are a lot of very tough questions being asked in these athletic departments of their fans, of their season ticket holders. To extrapolate it out further, I think there are other bigger questions that that these uh, that hasn't even like the conversation hasn't even begun about, right? So, like, say you only get forty thousand people into the Ohio State Michigan game, right? Say that. All of these states have decided that whether it is, and I think the game's in Ohio this year, I'm not even sure, but say the state of Ohio says you can't have anything more than 50% capacity. So I think the first question becomes, how do you choose the 40,000 people that actually get into the stadium when obviously hundreds of thousands, if not millions, want access to those tickets? But then I think the second question becomes, how do you stop the secondary market, right? I think this is a topic that is going to become more prevalent behind the scenes in college sports. We got the games. Now we might have to have social distancing at the games. And if we have social distancing at the games, how do we make sure that the people that we're giving tickets to actually use them? And what I mean by that is very simply this. Like I said, take the Ohio State Michigan as an example or Alabama LSU. Under normal circumstance, 90,000 people would be able to go. Say only 40,000 are able to go this year. How do you keep those 40,000, even one or two or five or 10 or 20 or 200 people from going on the secondary market, taking that ticket that is in hot demand and putting it on the market and getting 10 times the value that you normally would, right? Because I'll tell you what, the only thing that's going to piss off people more than not being able to get into a game when they're a season ticket holder is seeing tickets to the actual game above face value online and furthermore, people making money off tickets that they can't even get access to. So there are so many questions that need to be answered still in college athletics. I open the show by being incredibly positive. I open the show by saying like, look, this is a great step in the right direction. College football is back, baby. We got kids on campus. This is a great first step. But there are still a lot of questions to be answered. And the one thing that when I get on the phone with people behind the scenes in college sports, I keep asking them. 
What does the game day experience look like? What does social distancing look like if it gets to that point in college football? And the one thing that definitively no one says is, I just, Aaron, I just don't have an answer for that right now. Now, the good news is what I would say as I kind of wrap up this topic, we transition to basketball. The good news is, as I've said many times over the last couple weeks, the last couple months, we still have plenty of time to figure this out. We still have three and a half months. We still hopefully do not have to worry about this situation. Hopefully in a perfect world, whether it's wearing masks or we find a vaccine, which I know doesn't seem likely. I'm not trying to be a scientist. But hopefully in the next three and a half months, we can just sell out games and we can have 80,000 people in at Alabama or at, at LSU or at Clemson or at Louisville or at Kentucky. But if we don't, this is the next big question. I'm optimistic we have plenty of time, but we will have to wait and see.